Thanks for joining the webcast. Today we are going to take a look inside Widgmo 5, uh, a large scale JavaScript product. My name is Chris Bannon. I'm the product manager for Widgmo. Uh, I've been working for Great City for eight years uh, and I've been managing the Widgmo product line since we created it uh, five years ago. So today I'm gonna walk you through uh, how we build the project and manage the project, uh, as well as uh, show you uh, some of the technologies we use, uh, and hopefully you'll understand how to build and manage large-scale JavaScript projects. So what is Widgmo 5? Widgmo 5 is our set of JavaScript UI controls. Uh, we have zero dependencies, so if you want to use our UI components, you just need our own files, um, and they're very small. We specialize in data grids and charts. Uh, we really focus on these. Um, it's our specialty, so uh, we have a long history of developing them, um, especially our famous flex grid control. Uh, we've been developing that since the days of Visual Basic, uh, and we've continued to develop it in many different platforms, and now uh, it's finally in JavaScript. We focus on performance. Uh, it's our number one feature. We have to be fast. Um, we also want to keep our core control small and extensible. We have this philosophy where we just bake in the key features in our core controls and then our core controls have a rich extensibility model. Uh, and then for additional features that uh, many different customers have many different requests we provide those as extensions of our controls. Um, and we'll take a look at those uh, shortly. Uh, but to give you an example, we have many people that request a Excel-like filter on our flex grid. So we don't want to build that in. That would be you know, too much bloat to add to the control for everyone. Uh, but for the people that want it, we have an optional extension uh, that we offer them that extends the flex grid and adds that functionality using the extensibility of FlexGrid. So we offer those and then our customers develop their own extensions as well. Here's some interesting statistics about Wichmo. So we have a distributed team around the world uh, in US, Brazil, Canada, Russia, China, India, Myanmar, uh, and Japan. Uh, it's quite an experience uh, with such a distributed team. You know, we have meetings at very strange hours, uh, you know, for everyone. Um, sometimes it's late at night in the U.S., sometimes it's middle of the day for us. Um, uh, there are some communication challenges, but overall we work really well together, um, and it's a, a nice, diverse team that we have. We have over 100,000 lines of code in Widgmo 5. Um, that's not including the samples, that's just our, our uh, JavaScript code. Um, and then, you know, company-wide, we have millions. Uh, we have a lot of products in many different platforms. A lot of them are in the Microsoft uh, world, like in .NET, um, ASP.NET, Silverlight, WPF, things like that. Um, so we have a, a, a long uh, history of developing grids and charts in, in all these Microsoft platforms uh, for over 25 years. Uh, and just another interesting statistic is that our JavaScript FlexGrid control can data bind a million records in under one second. Um, that's something that, you know, I, when we first started Widgmo, I never thought, you know, uh, I would see that actually happening. So it's, it's pretty cool. It's a testament to JavaScript speed today and also, um, you know, really well engineered uh, JavaScript grid. So what makes Widgmo 5 special? Um, the most important thing is that we have true controls uh, and we write controls as classes just like we do in .NET um, and when I say controls I'm, I mean they are true controls they're not widgets so previously we had extended jQuery UI and we followed the jQuery pattern uh, in the widget factory uh, and uh, we, we just you know it was a great library for us to build upon when we first created Widgmo, but we know there's a better way uh, and you know that's just from our, our experience and, and you know really powerful frameworks like .NET um, and we, we wanted to build similar controls 
with similar APIs in JavaScript, and we know that, that that's possible, so we set out to do that. So just to give you a little an example of the difference here. Um, in the bottom, you can see there's a uh, widget, and this is our previous grid widget. What you do is you'd have a jQuery selector to find a DOM element, uh, and then you call a widget function. And that's how you initialize. If you wanted to set a property on that widget, uh, you do the same thing. You uh, have a selector to find the element. Uh, you call the widget grid function. Uh, only you pass in a parameter, three parameters. The first parameter is a string that just says option, and that means that uh, you want to uh, set a prop property or get a property. Uh, the next parameter is the actual property name, so show row header, and that's also a string. And then finally, the third is the actual value you want to set it to. So in this instance, we're setting show row header equal to true. Um, and you can see where there would be a lot of problems there. Sometimes you might forget to type in that option uh, string, you know, uh, just at all, and then the option name itself, or the property name, is case sensitive, so it's very easy to mistype that, um, especially since it's a string, and there's no checking against that or anything. Um, and it, it's just, you know, it's not a nice, clean way of working with an API. Uh, so up above, you could see the flex grid control, and this is the control pattern that we've created. Uh, you initialize a new control, uh, just like you would initialize a class. So we have a new widgmo.grid.flexgrid. Uh, and in that, we just pass in the, the ID of the DOM element uh, that we want to initialize against. Uh, the next line we look at here is a similar code or a similar you know, thing we're trying to accomplish. We're setting the row headers to visible. Uh, only we're not calling a function. We're just uh, setting a property directly on the flex grid. Uh, by assigning it a value. So with my flex grid dot headers visibility equals uh, and then the actual value we're setting it to. So there's no strings being used here. Um, we actually will get IntelliSense or autocomplete in an IDE um, that gives us the property name. Uh, and then just as a little bonus, we have uh, enumerations with um, the possible values for headers visibility. So you don't have to remember a set of strings, you can actually uh, use autocomplete to get all the different um, available options to set this to. We'll take a look at that working as well. The Wijmo 5 architecture is as follows. So we have our core and that contains uh, a, an event model, uh, collection view, uh, base control, globalization, and some styles. You know, the, the one that really needs called out there is Collection View. So Collection View is something that Microsoft released in um, the XAML space, so Silverlight, WPF, and it's a data management um, API, and it is based upon the idea of observability. So you can uh, get notified when anything changes, either a collection or a, or a single item. So we thought that was a missing part in JavaScript and we decided to implement that ourselves. Um, it's optional. If you want to use that, you can. All of our controls data bind to it. Uh, our controls can also be un used with plain JavaScript arrays as well. So it's totally up to you, but that's a, a really nice API that we were fond of and we wanted to bring that to JavaScript. All right, so uh, the row of dark purple boxes in the center here, uh, we have our core controls. So we have modules that contain these controls. So we have the grid, the chart, gauges, uh, input. Input contains a whole handful of uh, data entry controls. Um, and those, those are the core controls I talked about that having just the key features. At the very bottom you can see some light boxes and these are our extensions. So these are all the optional extensions that give you added features um, and you, know, you can kind of pick and choose which of these you'd like to use. You can use many of them at once. Um, so here you can, the very first one you can see is the flex grid filter, and that is the Excel-like filter that we just talked about. Um, so this, it's just a really nice way of providing features without uh, bloating our core controls.
Uh, and then up in the top right, you can see we have Angular Interop. Uh, we also have Knockout Interop, but um, Angular is kind of a, a main focus of ours. So uh, it's not required, it's optional. And then we have directives for each of our controls. So it's, it's something we handwrite, uh, and those are uh, available to you optionally if you want to use them. So let's take a look at some of these in action. This is our uh, Widgmo 5 Explorer. You can get there from the product page. Um, we have an introduction. You can see our globalization and look at the different cultures and formatting that we support. You can take a look at collection view and understand its API and some of its use cases. We also have an, uh, support for OData. Uh, you can understand our base control, the concept of control templates, uh, our event model, um, theming, um, and as well as tool tips, which are a nice little utility that we offer. Uh, input, as I said, we have a whole bunch of data entry controls. Um, just to give you an example, we have this nice uh, multi-select, so you can choose multiple items. If they fit in the text box, we'll show them. If they don't, we just show the count. FlexGrid is definitely our most popular control. Uh, this one is modeled after uh, our FlexGrid that we've written in you know, many other frameworks. Uh, it's, it's optimized for speed uh, and touch uh, interaction. Uh, I'll just show you a nice little feature here. So this is uh, a, a search filter. So I can say uh, US uh, GAD for gadgets, and then I only want to see the red. So there you, you can see I just filtered the grid down using um, this nice little search box. Uh, and you can see it's really fast. This one just has 500 items in it. Um, I'll show you a benchmark sample that shows you know, hundreds of thousands of items very shortly. FlexChart um, is a very nice chart. It's, it's straightforward, has a bunch of different chart types. It's also focused on performance and can handle you know, a million records without crashing because it, it, it optimizes its rendering to only render what it has to. We have a pie chart. We have linear gauge, radio gauge, and bullet graph, which is my favorite gauge. And that's really nice because it's for, you know, uh, benchmarking values against target values or, or problem areas. So that's a really nice gauge to use. All right, let's look at performance. So performance is something very important to us. Um, we we want to make sure we're fast. It's our number one feature. So um, let's just, first of all, we have, let's see, 5,000 records. So, you know, you'd expect to be fast, 5,000 records. Um, just look at some of the competition. Uh, NG Grid, which is Angular's original grid, and then UI Grid, which is the new uh, Angular UI grid, um, and you can see we're we're faster than most and and uh, on par uh, with the best. Let's bump this up to half a million records and go back to FlexGrid. FlexGrid, you can see it actually improved slightly. Um, it's not really meant to improve with more records, but uh, it's meant to not degrade. So you should get the same performance no matter what. The, Widgmo, the old widget grid is uh, similar in that way. Um, slick grid is pretty fast. Uh, Kendo is uh, on par with our old grid. Um, the IG grid has some issues here. That could be because of implementation. Mm, that's going to crash my browser. I'm going to refresh that so we so we don't crash it. Might crash it anyways. All right, let's try that again. We're not going to put a half million records in and try that again, though. All right, uh, let's try. Putting it on the flex grid. Let's go ahead and put half a million records in. 
and just look at some of the open source versions. So we have MZ Grid 1.6 seconds, UI Grid, um, which is the most up to date Angular Grid, is almost three seconds, and that's compared to under half a second for the Flex Grid. So performance really important to us, uh, and you'll have that same experience with our charts. All right. So uh, that is Widgmo. Um, now you have a nice understanding of the product that we build. Now I'd like to show you an inside look at how we manage that project as far as uh, technology goes. So our tools are a little unique. Um, I don't. I don't think a, a lot of JavaScript libraries and frameworks have the same setup as ours. Um, and it's probably a lot to do with our background um, being Microsoft partners and originally creating a lot of UI controls in Microsoft platforms. Um, we use a lot of Microsoft tools, so Visual Studio, TypeScript, um, both from Microsoft, um, but you know, we don't limit ourselves by any means. So we also use Angular, Bootstrap, um, Browser Dev Tools, and Browser Stack. And we use more than this, but these are kind of our uh, our core set of tools in our toolbox. So let's take a look at each of these uh, a little bit closer. Uh, Visual Studio. So we have a project set up for our Widgmo 5 control library. And we set it up just like we do a control library in C Sharp. So we have a project. Uh, we organize our namespaces into folders. So you see like widgmo.grid. That's a module or a namespace. Uh, and then we use TypeScript files for each of our classes. Um, for example, we have a cell factory in, within the widgmo.grid module or namespace. Uh, and then this builds just like a standard Visual Studio project. So um, we can compile it. Uh, the only difference is instead of creating a DLL uh, we're, or an assembly, we're creating JavaScript files. Our sample setup is uh, also in Visual Studio. Uh, each of our samples has a Visual Studio solution and project. Uh, and the cool thing is, is that the solution contains the sample project and the Widgmo 5 source code project. So every time we are developing and running a sample, the Widgmo 5 source code is compiled. Um, so we always uh, are able to, you know, make fixes or enhancements or, or do development right alongside our samples. And that's something that's really important to us. We, we take samples very seriously. We understand that developers you know, need a lot of samples uh, to help understand things and get moving quicker. So uh, that's why we have kind of like this first class sample set up. And this is for all of our samples. Um, and this is how we work with them. You know, when we distribute them, you certainly don't have to use Visual Studio. You can, but this is how we uh, specifically develop our samples in our source code. So uh, a nice thing about having this set up is we're able to debug source code um, as we're running and developing the samples. So we don't have to hop back and forth and build JavaScript and then copy that into a project and then run that project and see if it works. It's all integrated. So. Um, we have one, one build, one, you run the sample and the source code is automatically built and can be debugged. We're able to debug right from within Visual Studio. So we can uh, run the sample, we can set breakpoints in the sample, we can set breakpoints in our source code, uh, and it's going to uh, hit breakpoints and we can step through code and we can inspect it and see everything that's going on from Visual Studio, which is which is really nice because we're working with source code there. So notice that that's a TypeScript file, not a JavaScript file. So we're able to debug our source code even though we're running it as JavaScript in, in the client, which is pretty cool. Uh, we have a build system in place. So TFS is what we use for source, co source control, and that's Team Foundation Server. Uh, we have a nightly build process that runs uh, every night. Uh, and our typical build uh, has, has these following tasks, and we use MS build tasks to do this. So we compile the TypeScript, 
uh, and that is essentially taking all the TS files and compiling them um, as modules. So some of them get combined into a single file. Um, uh, so each namespace module gets its own uh, file. Um, and we add things like headers, licensing, copyright to the tops of the files. Uh, once we have our JavaScript compiled, we run unit tests. So uh, we use QUnit to write unit tests. Uh, if all of those unit tests pass, then our build passes and, and that build drops. Uh, if any of those unit tests fail, the entire build fails and then we get notifications of that and we know exactly who to blame and where to fix and all that. So it's, it's a very nice process. The nightly build also uh, is available to our customers and they're able to use it and test for things uh, and that's just kind of a nice way of getting uh, the latest code out to our customers. Uh, it's not been through a QA process, but it's passed all of our unit tests, so they at least know that. Um, it's, just, it's just a nice, nice thing to do and have. So TypeScript. Uh, TypeScript is something that was created a few years ago from Microsoft. Uh, it was created by Anders Halsberg, who is the creator of C Sharp and Delphi, and he's you know he's just a legend in the programming language community. Um, it, it, it's really, I think, a you know kind of a callback to C Sharp, and, and it gives nice C Sharp features. So uh, it is object oriented, um, and it has classes. And while it gives you C-sharp features, it's, it's actually in line with JavaScript. So TypeScript is kind of lined up with where the future of JavaScript is going to be. So it looks at ECMAScript standards and uh, it's, it's kind of implementing them and lets you use them before they're ready or before they're in every browser. And you're able to compile to either ECMAScript 5, which is what we do today, or target ECMAScript 6 which is something you know, that's kind of just emerging in modern browsers. Uh, some of the nice features it has, uh, you can easily do inheritance, um, which can be done in JavaScript. It just takes a little more expertise and, and you have to be a little more uh, careful with it. Uh, it automates that for you when you do it in TypeScript. It compiles all that uh, inheritance for you and, and the code that it requires to do inheritance in JavaScript. Um, we have type safety, so as we're developing, we can have strong typing. Uh, we get design time error checking, um, and it's uh, based on uh, standards, so we know we're kind of you know forward thinking and kind of future proof by using it. Uh, and it, it's been adopted by Google for Angular 2, so that's really, really kind of a significant thing that happened, uh, in that the Angular team was planning on having a similar language is TypeScript, but rather than write their own, they decided to just adopt TypeScript. And they have collaborated with Microsoft and uh, added some features to it, which is nice. So, you know, it's, it's not just something from Microsoft. It's something that, you know, Google and Microsoft are both investing heavily in. Um, so it, it's definitely a, a technology that's going to be around for a while. So how do we use it? Um, we use TypeScript. Um, for all of our source code, and um, and, I, and, I, and it is all of it. So the Widget 5 project that you saw, all the scripting in there is all done in TypeScript. Um, our developers have been able to apply their C# -sharp experience um, and skill, and, and and essentially be able to develop really high quality JavaScript components using their C# -sharp experience. Um, now we have a lot of JavaScript experience as well, but um, it was just kind of a bonus to be able to really quickly have that same object-oriented architecture that we would have in a C-sharp control library, only we're doing in JavaScript. Um, so we, we, can, we can get things like base control class, and then all of our controls can inherit that base control class, uh, and that's just something that's very nice and clean. We can make, you know, we can make changes across our whole library just within that base control. It's just it's a it's a really nice familiar way for C sharp developers to to get into JavaScript. 
Uh, some more nice features we get are IntelliSense or auto completion in Visual Studio. So as we're developing, um, we get auto complete um, for working with our components. We also get errors and we get warnings um, when programming. So we can see uh, runtime errors before we even get to runtime. So we'll, we can see if there's a type mismatch or a casting problem or we're passing in the wrong argument or calling the wrong uh, or, pass, or assigning the wrong value to a property, things like that, that we can catch before we even run our project. And that's invaluable, especially in JavaScript. That saves a lot of time from having to develop and then go run and then, you know, you get an error and your error is not always related to the, the root problem. So it's, it's a really nice way to catch things before they go out the door or before they're even run in the browser. Uh, it, our controls are also extensible because of TypeScript. Um, we can really easily extend our controls because they're classes and it's very easy to inherit or implement them um, and make extension classes uh, like that Excel like filter I mentioned. All right, so uh, now that you kind of understand our setup and the language we're working in, I'd like to show you uh, how we actually do that. So let's jump into Visual Studio here. Uh, and what I have is just a custom control, and this is how we would make a custom control if we were to sit down and write one um, that extends our base control. And the sample just has some script references uh, to our core control. Uh, it has reference to this my control file. Uh, it has some sample markup and some script that initializes these controls. So let's look at my control. So my control is a custom control. It's a class, you can see, and it extends widgmo.control. Uh, if I hover over widgmo.control, I actually get uh, some nice information about this class. And you know, I get the description. It's a base class for all widgmo controls. Um, and uh, uh, I can you know, further read here or just start using it, um, which is, you know, it's really nice. So we have, uh, we scroll down here, we can see uh, we have a control template, which is like an HTML template. Uh, all of our controls support this control template. Um, and that's so that the markup for our controls can be really flexible. Um, you as a customer don't have to worry about this, but say that you really wanted to customize the markup and in our control here you wanted to use a hyperlink instead of a button. You could easily change that as long as you keep this uh, WJ part attribute. And the WJ part attribute just kind of tells the control which parts of the markup are used for which parts of the control. And that allows us to be very flexible. Uh, and this, this is a very advanced feature. Um, to use, um, but we, we want to make sure it's there in case anyone does need it. So we come down to our constructor, and the constructor has two parameters. The first is the element, and that's just the DOM element that we're going to initialize against. If I hover over it, uh, you can see the description there is telling me exactly that. Uh, and then the second parameter has a question mark after it, and that means it's optional. Uh, and this is just the JavaScript object containing initialization data for the control. So that's like key value pairs for if I want to assign properties. Uh, then I come down to below that and we can see we're working with our template. And now here's an interesting bit of code. I have this dot get template and that's actually coming from our base control. If I hover over it, I can tell that, but let's see, I, I, I'm not sure what's going on in that function call, so I'm going to right click and go to definition. Now that's that's the really cool thing about this Visual Studio project setup. I can navigate my source code for the Widgmo 5 project from within a separate sample project. Okay, So we were in this sample project, I right clicked, go to definition to find this thing, and now we are in the control.ts file from within the Widgmo 5 project. Okay. And we're actually looking at that source code. So I can set a uh, breakpoint here, uh, and that's when I run this, it's going to tell me exactly what uh, is going on in here. 
Let's go ahead and do that. So now I'm debugging, so uh, I'm compiling the Widgmo 5 scripts uh, and we'll basically be running this in localhost and we will be running against the most up-to-date version of the Widgmo 5 source code. And this isn't how our customers have to develop, this is how we develop it. So. This is how we develop samples and, and are able to link them to our source code in TypeScript. All right, so there you can see we, we hit our breakpoint. Uh, I, I have this uh, TPL uh, variable added to my watch so I can come down here and see exactly what the value of this template is. I can see the string being returned. Um, I could step through it if I want. I can just uh, stop it now that I understand what it's doing. And let's go back and look at some programming here. All right, let's go down into our constructor. And let's say that uh, we wanted to put a data grid within this custom control. The way we do that, we type var grid equals new dot and once I have that I have all my uh, classes within this namespace so I'm going to start typing flex grid and I can see ah, I've already got it so I tab out and I open the call to it and I, I now get uh, IntelliSense that's telling me exactly what I need to pass in here. So that's, that's pretty neat. I know that I need to pass in an element. Uh, and since I have a base control, I'm going to say this dot, and I'm going to get all the available properties uh, from within the base control. So I know there's a host element. Let's get that. And now we've got a grid. And this is an instance of flex grid. Now I can say grid dot, and I'm going to get a list of all the um, members of FlexGrid. So I can see events, I can see methods, I can see properties. Uh, I'm just going to set allow, let's say we want to do allow sorting is true. So we want this to be sortable. So now let's set uh, selection mode. So let's do grid dot selection. Now you can see we also have events coming up. So I could also bind to on selection change, but that's not what I want. I want to set selection mode equal to widgmo, and this is that nice enumeration I was talking about. Widgmo dot grid dot selection mode dot. And now I have all my available options for that property, which is really nice. So um, I know what the valid values are. So let's set it to row. Um, I never had to go to the documentation to find uh, what the available uh, options were, which is really nice. So normally this would be a string and I'd have to go look in documentation to find out. In this instance, I didn't have to, which is really nice. All right, so now, um, Let's just accidentally set uh, is read only equal to six. Okay. Now immediately when I assigned that to a number, I got a red underline, and that's telling me there's a problem. So uh, the problem it's saying is the type number is not assignable to a type boolean. So since we have strong typing uh, and it's object oriented we're able to find errors like this before they even uh, get published so immediately I can see that this code is going to create an error at runtime or it might die silently I have no idea but it's a it's a bug that I just wrote so I'm able to see that as I'm developing comment that mistake out and now I'm not going to get any errors and I can compile and everything's good so that's 
kind of uh, TypeScript in a nutshell, how we work with it, some of the nice benefits that it gives us. Um, obviously, there's many more, but you know that's that's it in a nutshell for Widgmo. Angular JS. Uh, Angular is a MVVM framework um, that is from Google, and it's similar to things we have in .NET and XAML, only it's written in JavaScript. Uh, it supports things like two-way binding uh, and components. We really like the components here because it gives us kind of a, a familiar thing to build upon that we had in other frameworks like in .NET. So Widgmo supports AngularJS. Uh, as I pointed out earlier, we have those Angular directives for each of our JavaScript controls. Uh, and it is optional. So our directives uh, support two-way binding, but only for properties that benefit from it. So only if it's a property that's readable and writable uh, will there be two-way binding so that that control actually updates the scope or the, the view model. Um, and since our directives are all handwritten, we're able to make them you know, even more powerful and richer. For example, uh, we have cell templates in the FlexGrid, and that allows you to write markup that is defined for a column, so each cell within that column will render that markup, and that markup can be HTML, it can be uh, AngularJS directives, it can be other Widgmo components, but it can be anything, and that's just a nice way of being able to declare controls and then also even some nice things like cell templates where you're able to control even how each cell renders and, and you can see all that from within markup you don't have to go write a ton of JavaScript or read JavaScript to understand what rendering is going to look like uh, and declaring controls in markup is something that became really popular uh, in you know ASP.NET, um, Java Silverlight, WPF, and it's, it's just a nice way of managing UI. So it's very obvious. I mean, HTML is essentially declaring controls, but it's a very limited set of controls. So Angular gives you the ability of just adding a lot of rich controls that you can declare in HTML markup. All right, let's take a look at an Angular demo. So from our website, we have these getting started guides. Uh, and if you look at the getting started with FlexGrid in Angular, uh, that's probably the best place to start uh, to understand what's going on and how to start using it. Um, so what you can do is you can scroll down through here and you can see that we have uh, three tabs. Uh, HTML is telling you the HTML you need to get started. So you can see the script references that you need. You can also see how you declare an app in Angular and a controller. Uh, and then you can also see the markup for the flex grid itself. So this looks like HTML, but this is actually an Angular directive. And this, in this instance, we're creating a flex grid and setting its item source to data. And where's data coming from? Uh, that's part of our view model uh, or controller in Angular. So we look at the JavaScript that we need. Uh, and you can see that we're creating this data, it's just random generated data here in an array, uh, and then we're putting that in the scope. And the scope is like uh, the shared, uh, shared view model data. And then on the right you can see the actual running grid control and you can play around with it. And then as we scroll down you can see uh, there's, there's more things to show off. So in this instance you can define the columns with markup rather than just let the grid auto-generate them. Uh, you can use different selection modes. You can have cell freezing. And this just shows you how to configure all those either in markup or in the JavaScript itself. And if we scroll down, I can show you the cell templates that we were talking about earlier. Uh, in this instance, we want to put something like a image in the cells. Uh, we can actually, within the column, we can create an image tag that has its own binding in it. Uh, and uh, also put inline text rendering here so that this is going to create an image with the flag 
um, and the country name rendered out in text. So that's the getting started guide. Another really great place to uh, start using the controls, uh, especially within Angular, is the documentation. So if we go to widgmo.angular module, uh, and then we pick out something like the flex grid, uh, then we can we can see the you know information about it in documentation. You can see markup, but one of my favorite things is you can click a live example. And that's going to open up a JS fiddle that has the resources that you need already included. It has the markup that you need for a flex grid. You can see we have a flex grid where we're setting our item source. And this is similar to that other getting started guide. But we also have a flex chart in here. If we look at our uh, controller, we're doing the same thing. We have some generated uh, array with random data. Uh, this one we're actually creating a collection view rather than just uh, using the raw data. And that allows us to do a little bit more change tracking and auto updating in the controls, which is really nice. And that's really all the code we need. The below code is just showing and hiding the grid. That's not important. But really the only code that we needed um, was to create data and put it in a collection view. And then the markup was creating or declaring the controls and binding them to that collection view. And if we go over to the results and we want to do something like edit the US sales to be 100 and the chart automatically changes to 100. If we want to do UK, let's change that to 200 and UK automatically changes to 200. So there was no code that we had to write to do that. And this is the power of both the collection view that automatically detects changes and notifies uh, other controls that data has changed. Uh, and it's also the power of Angular. Uh, Angular has that data binding and, and built into it so that you also get uh, you know, re-rendering when things change. So uh, you'll still get this behavior without Angular, but uh, you won't get the nice markup and, and um, the shared scope this way, but you'd still get that um, automatic update. So let's change this to 9,000. You can see that Germany automatically changed in the chart to match what we edited in the grid. And no code was written in the sample to do that. That's just, that's the power of collection view uh, and the Wichmo 5 controls uh, used in Angular. All right, uh, so Bootstrap. Bootstrap is a mobile-first UI framework. And essentially, it's like building blocks for UI in an application. And it's a really good way to jumpstart the UI in an application. Um, so it's got things like forms, navigation, uh, responsive layouts, uh, and icons. So Widgmo likes Bootstrap. We like it a lot. Um, our default theme matches Bootstrap, uh, so it's very it's very easy to just throw our controls into a page that uses Bootstrap, and it'll just match very nicely. Uh, we also use Bootstrap in our samples, so we use it for uh, the layout, so we get responsive layout. Uh, we use it for navigation and, and the other simple UI like buttons and tabs. And by using Bootstrap for the simple stuff that allows us to focus on just the complicated UI controls like grids and charts. Um, we are able to, you know, completely focus on performance on grids, charts, and then building out features. And then we can just reuse uh, the Bootstrap UI components in our samples. Uh, and that, that's, that's something that saves us a lot of effort and a lot of time. And, you know, a lot of our customers do the same thing. They're just they use Bootstrap, uh, and then they use our components, and they're able to really quickly build uh, applications. All right, browser dev tools. So uh, we spend a lot of time in browser dev tools. Um, you know, the, the browser dev tools are something that in every modern browser, you can open up the dev tools and see what's going on exactly on every web page. Uh, and the things we use it for are inspecting elements, 
Uh, we use it for stepping through our code. We use it for profiling for performance. Um, so we do memory profiling to find leaks. So memory leaks. So we're looking for anywhere where we're um, uh, collecting data or creating new data that we're not destroying it. Um, it's not being garbage collected. Um, we also do FPS monitoring to prevent jank. So uh, FPS is frames per second. Uh, and there's utilities built in so that you can measure uh, the frames per second. So uh, when someone's scrolling our grid, we want to make sure that the frames per second doesn't drop drop down uh, and create like a jerky motion or um, you know it just makes it look like the page is lagging. And we make sure that our controls don't affect that um, performance in any way. Uh, and then we also use it for emulating devices. So. Uh, this is not so much emulating real devices, it's more for testing different uh, screen sizes, and I'll show you that as well. And then another tool we use is BrowserStack. Uh, BrowserStack is a service that you can use, it's through, through the web browser, and it gives you uh, cross-device testing. So from BrowserStack, you can test on pretty much any browser, uh, on any device running any operating system uh, and there's there's tons and tons I mean there's probably you know hundred thousand dollars worth of hardware you're able to emulate and test against uh, it's just a couple bucks a month so it's well worth it for us uh, it's ideal to quickly confirm issues or fixes in environments that you don't have um, set up so if you don't have access to hardware and you need to confirm something on a piece of hardware It's a great way to do that um, It's also a really nice way to connect to localhost from a device uh, so you're able to actually debug localhost projects on a emulator and uh, You don't have to do any kind of special setup. They have a nice browser add-on that makes that really easy uh, And that can be something that's pretty hard to set up yourself if you're not experienced in um, networking or in um, tunneling, things like that. Um, and it covers most needs for testing. So it's a nice way for testing on mobile devices. Um, some of the downfalls, it's not ideal for debugging. It's just too slow and too laggy to really do any quality debugging with. Um, you know, you need a hardware device that's uh, connected to a computer to really get good debugging experience. And it's not ideal for testing performance issues. Um, remember, you're using a browser to emulate a device across the web. So it's going to be slow. It's going to be a little bit unresponsive. And you have to, you have to expect that. And you can't, um, can't really debug performance issues on it because of that. All right, so let's give this a shot. Close some of these windows and open up our Explorer again. Show the flex grid. Now the best way to get to um, the browser dev tools or the quickest way anyways is just right click anywhere on a web page and inspect element. That's also a nice way if you want to look at something very specifically you can right click it and it'll find it within the, the elements or the DOM. Uh, and then once you have that selected, you're able to scroll through on the right side and see any styles that are applied to it. You can modify the styles, you can disable styles, uh, and you can see exactly where the styles are coming from. And you can open up the style sheet and see you know, exactly which line is affecting it. We can go into console, see if there's any errors. It looks like we have a 404 error from a path we're trying to resolve. Um, so you can see very quickly uh, what problems you have. You can also test for things in the console by typing out commands. You can look at your network resources. You can look at all the source files in the page, set breakpoints in the JavaScript, and for device emulation, you click this button here. I already had it clicked, so that's why you see these um, black rulers at the top and left side of the page. Uh, and then at the very top, I can click this orange drop down and I can choose different devices to test with. 
I'm going to minimize this so we get a little more space here. So here we are looking at uh, the same page on an iPad. You can see I can use this kind of touch gesture to scroll through the grid. It's got inertia scrolling. I can scroll horizontally, vertically. I can uh, click on navigation. And uh, you know it's optionally zoomed. You don't have to make it way zoomed out. It's just zoomed to fit in this real estate right now. Uh, and notice how the, the layout changed. So if I uh, reset to a desktop, uh, the layout's now on the left-hand side. When I choose the Apple iPad, the layout goes to the top, the navigation goes to the top. Um, and that's just a nice uh, part of Bootstrap. So that's, that's the responsive layout and responsive utilities in Bootstrap. If I go to a phone size, you'll notice that it changes even further. So now, now the menu's in this nice little drop-down, and we can navigate similarly. Um, again, you get this nice touch gesture so you can test how things work um, on a touch device. And you can see um, how, how nicely the sample is changed um, by Bootstrap. And that's just some of the nice, nice uh, benefits of using a library like Bootstrap. All right, let's go to Browser Stack. and do some testing on a emulator. So now I'm going to choose an iPhone. Now this is a, is a real simulation. This is uh, actually remoting into a uh, you know, Mac OS and it's got an iPhone 6 simulator running where I can you know, open up different apps, but really I just want to use the browser uh, and it's going to load you know, whatever the last URL was. It happened to be the same Explore and I can you know see the real thing now. I'm going to navigate to a different page. If I want, I can choose a different theme. Navigate to a different page again. Let's look at the grid. See how that new theme looks. Nice clean looking theme we have there. And you can see it's just it's a nice way for testing things. Um, really, uh, if you have bugs with rendering, you're able to really quickly jump in here and confirm them. Uh, if I click switch, I can look through all these different Android devices with all the different uh, Android versions. So that's really important. Um, for example, recently we had a report of an issue that was only on Android like 4.1 or below. So we were able to get used the Galaxy S3 with 4.1 installed. They had an issue with rendering SVG. The only way we could confirm that was using this. Um, again, we couldn't debug it, but we could see exactly what was going on. We knew, we did some research, we fixed it, and then I was able to confirm the fix through browser stack. Just, it's, it's a really nice way of testing a bunch of different devices uh, really quickly. All right, so thank you very much for joining me. Uh, this has uh, been fun for me to kind of give everyone an inside look at our project and how we, how we manage it and the different technologies we use. I hope it was helpful for you. Um, I'm gonna leave these resources up on the screen for a few minutes here uh, in case you'd like to visit any of them. Uh, I highly recommend you give Widgmo a try and download, um, test out our performance for yourself. Definitely take a look at some of the things we use like TypeScript and Angular and Bootstrap as well. Uh, again, I hope it was helpful. I hope you learned something and I hope you have as much success managing large-scale JavaScript projects that we do.